Right. Now, uh, re revising on uh, ISA number 315, ISA number 315, risk assessment and ICS. Now, issues of risks, risks are classified into three, business risks, audit risks, and engagement risks. <laughs> business risk, audit risks, and uh, engagement risks. Now, the element of business risk, the element of business risks. Eh? This is the English meaning we know when you're talking about risks. When somebody tells you it's a very risky business, what are they telling you? Yes, you can lose. You can easily lose into that business. You can easily run into losses. You can easily uh, experience challenges, huge challenges that uh, may even take off. That's what it means. It's very risky. It's very risky. Yes. Do you have some people taking six units in this class? <laughs> yes. Some other friends will tell you it's very risky, but I don't believe it's very risky. Because the, the financial management teacher will tell you that they have the risk, they have the return. They have the risk, they have the, they have the returns. But of course, some people will view it it's very risky. It's very risky. So business risk. These are the, uh, the negative effects. Negative effects on the business. Negative effects are uh, on the business. E.g., learning into losses. Learning into losses. Theft. Theft. Now, it is see these negative effects. And you agree with me, if, for instance, at personal level, you are able to know the risk that I'm exposed to as a person, what does it mean? If you are able to know the risk that I'm exposed to as a person, it means you understand me. You know the business I do. You know how I stay. You know my side has a source because if you're able to tell me this is risky, this is risky, this is risky, then it means you have vast understanding of the client. That's what uh, analyzing of business risks uh, uh, means. All right, classified into four. Into four. I'm just highlighting, highlighting because you already have them, plus I'll share the notes. So just a summary. Roman number one, we talk of financial risks financial risks, eh? which you said that this relates to relates to financial distress. <laughs> financial distress. You see financial risks relating to fin financial distress. That e.g. e.g. it is manifested by inability. Inability to pay creditors. To pay creditors when they fall due, when they fall due, B, adverse, adverse key financial ratios. We talk of, uh, we talk of the element of dividends, dividends falling in areas, Dividends falling in areas. We even talk of D, current liabilities exceeding current assets. E, we even talk of uh, long term, long term debts falling due, long term debts falling due with no prospects, with no prospects of making them good, of making them good. We even talk of uh, F, of a reliance, of a reliance on short-term loans, of a reliance on short-term loans. Why am I listing all these points? 
because later when we're discussing going concern, these are financial indicators of going concern problems. These are financial indicators of going concern problems when we get to discuss uh, going concern. All right. Then we have from number two, compliance risks. You agree with me when you have financial distress. That's a risk because you may even end up closing down. We've seen entities closing down because they are not able to meet the obligations. So compliance risk arises, arises as a result of non-adherence, of non-adherence. Yeah, we've seen entities closing down. There's a time Kiroch had closed for some time. Yes, because of non-payment of taxes. Yeah, they had they have closed several place of rights for quite some time. We, we have seen who is closing down. We have seen some even schools closing down because of non-compliance. We have seen um uh, hospitals, chemists closing down. There's even a time that Tuskes had closed down one of its branches here in CBD because of non-compliance to competition authorities of Kenya, which requires that you cannot operate more than 50% plus one of business in CBD. Where's Fanya Ivo? Yes, task case was in excess of 53%. So ndiyo upper tomboya, wakafunga moja wakaifanya kiyo boutique. Can you recall those times? Ndiyo EHA plus for market, because they, they were in excess of 53% within the CBD. So non-compliance uh, is that we've seen slot houses closing down in the great closing down because of improper disposal of waste. So that's how serious compliance is, is an element of business risk affecting your business negatively, affecting your business um, negatively. So you can give examples, e.g. from number one, non-compliance, to capital markets authority. Capital markets authority guidelines. Comma number three and compliance to statutory to statutory requirements, e.g. payment of taxes. Payment of taxes. Number three, non compliance to stock exchange. Stock exchange regulations. We've seen entities being delisted from stock exchange. Yes, I think they're quite delisted. Una company, um, just meet. Cement company uh, that uh, most recently was delisted. I can't recall its name. I don't know. I can't recall its name, but I saw it in the news. I saw it in the news. Somebody saw it. Can't recall which it was. Again, issues of uh, non compliance to environmental, to environmental regulations. All those non-compliances expose us to business risks. They, they can ask them to be closed down. We've seen some, some pubs closing, some pubs. Are they pubs or even bars in Kirinyaga? Yes, they're being vetted afresh. If they're non-compliant, they're closing down. That's business risk. The business operations is, is negatively affected. So that was compliance risk. Roman number three, we talk of uh, external, external risks. Eh? Aspects, this relates to aspects. Aspects which cannot be manipulated, manipulated by the management, by the management. E.g., we use the acronym, Pestel DC, for those who have got the notes. Pestel DC. This is political, political issues, economical 
issues, social cultural, technological, ecological, legal, demographic, and competition. Those are external environmental factors that as management, we cannot manipulate, but they affect our business operations directly or indirectly. They affect our business operations directly uh, or indirectly. Roman number four, we talk of internal, internal stroke operational, operational risks. Of course, this is within the control of management, but they pose risk to the operations of an entity. You see like A, errors and frauds, errors and frauds. There are entities which have crossed down because of fraud. A mega or several mega frauds are perpetrated, bringing the entity on its knees. To come up, monies have been embezzled and so on. Errors and frauds, they are within the reach of the management. Management can always institute very strong internal control systems to curb this vice, to curb this vice. B, over-reliance, over-reliance on a single product or on a single product line. That you're only dealing with one product. That's very risky. But if the customers bought out your product, you're not in business. But as a management, you can always diversify. You can always uh, uh, diversify. At least if it's a college, you have CASNEB, you have NEC, you have internal certification because the, the things can go south and uh, you are likely to close down. So it's within the reach of the management. C, we talk of a loss of, loss of customer, loss of license. Can you recall the element of franchising? What was franchising? Just to franchise. Franchising. Yeah, trading under somebody's name. Uh, you can be given a franchise by Coca-Cola to, to, to sell their product or even manufacture. We have manufacturing franchising. But of course, it operates under very strict and a very strict guidelines. And so you can lose the license because of non-compliance. There are do's and don'ts in a franchising agreement. You go against some, then you're likely to lose the license. So it's an internal. Operations breakdown. Operations breakdown. Yeah, it's what Murkomen was facing with Kenya Airways, airport in Jomo Kenyatta. That when the rights go, there's no start by a generator. It's internal. It is internal. Because they can always put in place uh, those systems, computer systems. We need to have a backup system. We need uh, turnover, F. Um, management. management and staff. Management and staff turnover. So management can always work towards this. In developing countries, it's all about paying good salaries and improving the working environment. That we are able to extend the stay of employees. Yes. So this is a computer systems failure, operations breakdown, management and staff turnover. All these are internal. Get these points right. And uh, ISA 570, ISA 570, the rest to going concern, they are classified into three. We talk of financial indicators of going concern problems. Operating indicators of going concern problems, these two are classified as other indicators. So they are very important points. In an exam, you may find them giving around 16 marks. We we'll discuss this under going concern topic, under going concern topic. So those are the four categories of business risks, of business risks. If you allow me, I can lab here. Yes, I can lab here to discuss the last thing about uh, business risks. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We call this risk-based. 
risk based audit approach or top down top down audit approach even if you forgot something today kindly don't forget this this is very very technical very technical previous rate used to be tested on at this level but currently even at advanced level they are testing this asking on advantages and disadvantages of risk based audit approach so what you're supposed to get right is what is it we, we have four main audit approaches voting system based balance sheet and risk based audit approach we have those four i, I, I already shared them in your whatsapp I, I believe they're somewhere the audit approaches i've already shared yes they are there uh, i share this note in advance what are they doing? Oh, yes. And sometimes you'll find me sharing them all the hours. When I think of something and I realize it will be more helpful when it's with you and not with me, I look for it and share immediately. Okay. So we have to cover them, but I've already shared. I've already shared to make sure that uh because now this let me explain what it is. How do you define auditing? Auditing is an independent examination of books of accounts, records, and vouchers to examine whether they portray to and fair view. We are calling this top-down approach because what it does, eh? check this, it analyzes the risks, then we get down to the financial statements. So we don't first evaluate the financial statements. We, we choose first to understand the risks which the client is exposed to, then we get down to the financial statements. How advantageous is this? advantages you know what happens you are able to identify high risk areas and low risk areas this one enhances efficiency yes enhances efficiency in auditing plus number two because you already understand the like how i explained risk first if you're able to understand the risks of a client it means Proper understanding of the client, proper understanding, or even vast understanding of the client, which is a plus. Remember, you discussed it's a number 310, that we need to understand the client properly before we audit them. So understanding risks means vast understanding of the client. It's very practical. I explained that if I can tell the risk that you are exposed to, then I know you in and out. That's a plus. Roman number three. It means a good relationship. Good relationship between the auditor and the client. Who can recall some points you discussed and the problems in planning? Problems encountered in planning. Somebody can recall the problems in planning. Number one is Hostility on the part of the management. To so discuss six problems. Reason number one, ambulance changes, turnover, hostility on the part of the management, having so many clients with similar year ends, those points. Eh? Then we discussed safeguards. Amongst the safeguards was create a good rapport between yourself as an auditor and the client. So risk-based audit already indicates that there is good relationship between the two because who will open up to you? If you're not in good relationship. So that's what you're saying. Number three, number four other reduces the auditor's exposure, the auditor's exposure to risk. But I will define audit risk. It has got two definitions. Audit risk means auditor forming a wrong opinion forming a wrong opinion or a misreading misreading opinion. This is when you report that the books of accounts portrays to and fair view when they don't. This is when you report that the financial statements have been presented fairly in all material respect, when that is not the case. That is what we call audit risk, forming a misreading opinion. So when you go for risk-based audit, we reduce auditor's exposure to risk. Why? You know, you understand the client so well. You have vast understanding of the client. You have good relationship with the client. So you are able to access all the relevant information and explanations, putting you in a better position to report about the client, hence reducing your exposure to risk.
reducing your exposure uh, to risk. So number five, avoids. Avoids over or under auditing. Avoids over or under auditing. Over auditing is doing more than what is required. And the auditing is doing less than what is required. You know, by identifying the high risk areas, you know, you need to concentrate most here because it's a high risk area. Low risk area, you need not to waste a lot of time on them. So you avoid over auditing or under auditing. Just like in an exam, sometimes you you will found yourself over answering. Yes, a person is worth two marks, like even you will be so much before you end on So you can appoint me exam. Yes, so you write a lot, and it's only two marks. That's over answering, and the answering is when you meet a question like you've never heard of it. It's worth eight marks. Then you do two lines. Yes, just to ensure you answer all the questions. That is. And that answering. So in auditing, risk-based audit approach, we avoid over, over, over auditing and other auditing. Number six, number six, a uh, uses risk model. Uses risk model. What is risk model? Audit risk. Audit risk equals to inherent risk. Inherent risk times control risk times detection risk times detection risk. Do you know every time we use risk model, it makes our audit exercise defensible, making audit defensible. Anytime we use mathematical formulas in auditing. Later, when I'm discussing ISA 530 audit sampling, we'll discuss two methods of sampling statistical, which is mathematical, non statistical, which is judgmental. So, when you go non statistical, you face problems because you can easily be biased, sometimes subconsciously. Yeah, you can be biased subconsciously. For instance, I can ask you to choose to select five ramless shares here. You find yourself choosing the most, those that look very new without showing subconsciously. Yeah. So, when you go mathematical, audit risk equals to inherent risk times control risk times detection risk, it make, makes your audit exercise defensible. Since when you go mathematical, it's formulas which influence on what you select, the conclusions you make, and not you as a person, and not you uh, as audit risk equals to Jacqueline. Audit risk equals, let me write it here. I know I've squeezed there. Audit risk equals to inherent risk multiplied by control risk multiplied by detection risk. I will explain what they are here because they are the components uh, of audit risk. They are the components uh, of audit risk, making audit exercises defensible, making audit defensible you are able to defend why why roman number seven the one i can recall uh, of that you can say i uh, used can be used can be used by the auditors to defend themselves defend themselves in a court of law in a court of law. I remember auditors' liability, light, lab, light left center. We said that auditors operate in highly litigious environment. They can easily find themselves in court, so they need to keep on defending uh, themselves. So can be used by the auditors to defend themselves in a court of law, in a court of law. We can't get those advantages right. And it's easy to recall them if you get right what is risk-based audit approach. Ukisha kumbuka hii, there is likelihood that you record around four or five points. Four or five uh, points. Disadvantages. Disadvantages, number one, is that um, quantifying this is not easy. How do we even say inherent risk is eight, this is six, this is seven? Yes, auditors. Auditors face charges. 
in quantifying in quantifying audit, audit risk components <clears throat> quantifying audit risk components not very easy to quantify those number two requires a large population requires a large uh, population to use the risk model or to be able to arrive at a reasonable, reasonable statistical conclusion. To arrive at reasonable statistical conclusion, we require a large population. What it means, eh? you cannot go statistical when you're auditing just one computer like this one or one table like this one. But when you are examining hundred thousands of transactions, statistical goes for well. Judgmental, it's called judgmental when components are few. We we'll list down those points under the sampling topic. So it requires large population. Then number three, mechanizes. Mechanizes the audit approach. Mechanizes the audit approach. Those who have come across management as a subject somewhere, you discussed somebody known as Max Weber, who is the father of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is characterized by lots of rules and regulations. Actually, sometimes we refer to it as red tape type of management. And so is mathematical formulas. Actually, auditors generally say they, they so much discourage use of mathematical formulas in auditing. They argue out that auditing is not a mathematical discipline to be reduced to simple mathematical formulas. So despite the challenges we face when we go judgmental, number one being biasness, the auditors will still go for non-statistical because that's where they feel that their expertise and experience is at play. Because after you to me, your expertise, your skills, your experience is at play. But here, it's like driving in an automatic car. Sometimes you're not fully in control. You know, when you're doing manual, you, you decide when, to, although not basically you engage gears when you wish to, uh, to do it. This is the risk-based audit approach. Risk-based, very important, very important, very important. Uh, important. Majors are thinking when the pastor is preaching and Ongiag and Asema, Naskim come up up on a mutua on a sheet of flannel and Naskia Pastor Asema. Whereas when I'm lecturing this, I have a feeling that it is in the exam. I have a feeling, I have a strong feeling. Although we are not only reading for the exam purposes, but I have to mention that. I have a strong feeling. Strong feeling. Yes. And as a quote, query for Babu Najamina, Puan Miyokoka, Mutua Miyokoka, you are able to connect, you are able to. Ah, sour, 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 sour. So this one I was just bringing you up to speed. Eh? I know it was covered in the in the recorded video, but you know sometimes we face challenges, and I regard it as a very important topic. Very important topic. All right, now we have audit risk. Number two, audit risk. Actually, it was covered halfway. It was covered halfway. We've already said what it is. The risk that the risk of an auditor forming a wrong opinion. A wrong opinion or basically misreading. Misreading opinion. E.g., we say when the auditor, when the auditor reports that the financial statements, financial statements portrays a true and fair view when they don't. When the auditor reports that the financial statements portrays a true and fair view when they don't, that's audit risk. That's audit risk. That's audit. It happens. We've ever seen the cases of misdiagnosis, a patient being misdiagnosed. And we hear that he may have come out when he had traveled. Kumbi ata ni kurara ulira viba ya usiku unauma la joints. Una pewa dosi ya seven days. It happens. It happens. That's the case here. That the an auditor may misdiagnose the situation, then the report all is okay. I usually give the case of uh, the Chase Bank, the Imperial Banks which went under some times back, the auditor's report remained a clean report. 
and you saw them closing down. So it may happen that you form a misleading opinion or a wrong opinion. Three components. Three components of audit risk. Number one, inherent risk. <laughs> Number two, uh, control risk. Number three, detection risk. So we start with the inherent risk. Inherent risk, we say that this is the susceptibility. This is the this is the susceptibility of misstatements. In the financial statements, in the financial statements, due to lack of related internal control systems and the environment, and the environment in which a client operates in. This is the susceptibility of misstatements in the financial statements due to lack of related internal control system and the environment in which the client operates in. I don't know why, or it's on me, that I take it serious when one uses the word susceptibility. When I'm marking, I see the word susceptibility. I don't read the other story. <laughs> It's true, because instruction number one, when you're marking, we are told, mark, don't read. So, you know, there are things you can see and you tell this person is right. Huh? It's very true. What is being susceptible? When you say that financial statements are susceptible to misstatements, we are saying that they are prone to misstatements. They are exposed to misstatements. That's what susceptible means. That financial statements are prone <laughs> to misstatements because of lack of related internal control systems. Sometimes we do without controls. And we know we need them. We know we need them, but you're not able to put them in place. Reasons being like, number one, because of the cost implication. Kuna maadu meza kuo mejenga kanyumba, na unaona unafaa kuo na electrical fence. You're supposed to have CCTV. Kiwanja na kanyumba. But when you do the cost analysis, you see, you do without them for a while. What does that mean? Why had you considered the electric coil fence? Why had you considered CCTV? Because you are exposed to some risks. You wanted to, to arrest them with, uh, with the physical controls. So if you, uh, you stay without them, it means that you are exposed to those risks until you put those controls in place. So lack of controls makes an entity to be prone, to be exposed, to be success susceptible to financial statements misstatements. <laughs> it's very practical. Then, because of the environment in which the client operates in, there are some environments which makes us so exposed, so susceptible uh, to misstatements. And that's why we stopped at, although uh, I can give these explanations, then discuss the other components of uh, audit risk. The environments classified into two environments classified in four. We talk of Roman one management characteristics, Roman number two, industry, industry characteristics. Number three, engagement. Engagement characteristics from number four, financial characteristics. So if, if you can discuss management characteristics, management characteristics, eh? we say inherent risk. Inherent risk is assessed to be high when some points here, A, 
management. Management lacks relevant <coughs> experience. Management lacks relevant experience. B, management dominates in administration. Administration of business. C, management's integrity and reputation are uh, questionable. Number D, management's turnover, turnover rate is high. <coughs> E, management, management pay, expect, stroke rent on bottom line. F, Management operating under pressure. To meet. To meet. Set targets. To meet set targets. G. Management. Adopting. Management adopting aggressive. Management philosophy is compared to conservative management philosophy. Those points discusses management characteristics. Those points discusses management characteristics. That inherent risk is assessed to be high. What is inherent risk? That financial statements are highly susceptible to financial misstatements. When management lacks relevant experience. If management are not experienced, the financial statements are highly prone to misstatements. If they are experienced, they are able to detect issues even before they happen. Because they are experienced. But um, if you are not experienced, Unakuta, you even as management, it's you who is signing, approving some use of resources. You can't detect. But if you have experience, you are able to tell when things are, have not even gone wrong. Management dominating, eh? it's like if we don't have an internal audit function, like see what's happening at count level. We have a uh, Senate, we have MCAs, they pre oversight role. So governors do not dominate in the administration of counties. And they're still perpetuating fraud. You can imagine if we didn't have a Senate or we didn't have MCS, it will be worse. It will be disastrous. So if management dominates, it's one man show. Inherent risk could be assessed to be high. Management integrity and reputation is questionable. Persons of uh, questionable integrity. You assess inherent risk as being very high. You know we want to reduce auditors' exposure to risk. Because you may look at somebody and you think that they are not corrupt. They are persons of integrity. So we don't assume that. Turnover is very high. Every time we have new management in place, there are some persons who can take advantage of this and perpetuate mega frauds. Somebody who just are there, you are the accountant in your company? Ah, most welcome. So you have some checks. We are signing to pay so and so. And since you are yet to be conversant with the controls in place, you find yourself perpetuating fraud unknowingly or being privy to such arrangements uh, unknowingly. So every time we have high management turnover, it assess inherent risk as being very high. Management's pay on performance. You can imagine you are told you are the director and you'll be paying 10% of the profits made. What are they telling you? You can manipulate records to record huge profits so that you earn high income. And it's possible because like provisions for budgets, it's an estimate. 
you can record a lesser amount so that you record a, a decrease in provisions for budgets. A decrease in provisions for budgets is an income. To exaggerate on incomes. The provision, these are estimates. You can post some figures there to ensure that uh, you record huge profits so you can easily manipulate financial statements. If there is pressure to meet set targets, but you are told we, are, we have recruited you as a way of turning around the operations of the business. For the last five years, we've been learning into losses. Now we need you to turn around this business. Otherwise, uh, you'll, be, you'll be considered a liability in the business. What are they telling you? You can do everything possible to report satisfactory performance. So in the search, you can easily manipulate records. Financial statements highly susceptible to misstatements. Adopting an aggressive management philosophy. Aggressive management philosophy is where management keeps on trying new things, trying new markets, new products, new marketing strategies. Other times, these new ways do not work out, but they would still want to convince the shareholders that these policies are working out. That way, they can easily manipulate records because they know that shareholders can reprimand them by replacing them. Then uh, conservative management are the ones who copy-paste what we, we call them the me too. Me too. Because they copy-paste that has that which has already been tested and has proved to work. So how oh, an risk. How oh, an risk. So get those points right. Get those uh points. No sound. Is somebody to confirm whether we have sound? Like, you know, it's saying no sound. That is its action. It's okay. Sound, sound is very okay. Mine is okay. Yes. Techno can recheck. Techno can recheck. Maybe you have a network. Yes. The guy calls him uh, self techno. Techno. It's Grace is saying it's okay. M um, is okay. Juma, it's fine. All right. Then if we are we are good to go. So Jama and the network here. I'm an yaya tell. <laughs> in the comments, the man from Ombokoro, Ivan Ajit, a man from Ombokoro. Let's check the, check the network. All right, that's management characteristics. Then we can look at industry characteristics. Industry characteristics. Industry uh, characteristics. Eh? So number one, we look at uh, financial financial position and performance. Here we say, if performance is good, if they are good, if performance is good, if performance is good, inherent risk is assessed, is assessed to be low. And the opposite is true. You know what you're saying here? Like, even here in class, who is likely to do a Mwakenya? Mutu wa meiva amu mwenye ajaibu. Ni mwenye ajaibu. Sisi wenye tumeiva saa mwakenya, atuwezi yuona maana yake. Because we are already okay. Our, our performance is okay. We don't need to manipulate. But if it's not okay, there are other reasons. There are other incentives to manipulate records. There are other incentives to manipulate records. You can allow me to discuss point number two and number three together. Uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity of interest rates and inflation. Then number, number three, industry. Industry of operation. What we we'll discuss here is, is performance predictable? Performance predictable, we say inherent risk. Inherent risk is low. We mean like the industry of perform industry of operation. 
if you're dealing in an industry which can be predicted, which industry is highly predictive? That you know how it performs. Which one? Bank. Banking is predictable. When can we say is peak season for them off peak season? When interests are high? Like now. Uh -huh. How is it performing? Performance is expected to improve. Performance is expected to improve. They are very susceptible to take up more loans. Uh -huh. That increases the, the risk. risk. Which risks are banks exposed to? Yes, the element of non performing loans. <laughs> so we have an element of credit risk. Yes, we talk of credit risk. We even talk of uh, uh, foreign, foreign exchange risk. Yes, foreign exchange risk. Like the way Dora sharing is gaining against Dora. Are they losing or gaining? You know, this, you are losing, eh? Yeah, such risks, <laughs> such risks. It's true. So banks can be predicted. It's like the vehicles, the, the way we do. We know peak and off peak season for motor vehicles. Like when you're going home at eight thirty, we don't expect traffic. If you met traffic somewhere, you know there's an accident somewhere, because you can predict. Even during the day when you're coming to town at around eleven, you meet some traffic somewhere. There's trouble, because you don't expect. I'm a, I'm a hotel industry. Yes, hotel industry, you know, peak season, April, August, December. If you find that hotel reporting good performance in January than in December, even as an auditor, you ask them. That's why we are saying when performance is predictable, inherent risk is low. Because you can always query how. You know, it's predict performance is predictable. But if it's not predictable, Inherent risk is very high because anything can be reported and it can always be justified. That's what we mean. Number four, uh, we talk about this point is disappearing. And how can oh, can I move to the be a default risk? Joe, Joe is talking of uh, uh, default risk. It's industry organization. Then we talk of uh, organization of operation. No, no. Let me, let me, let me get for you a better term there. This up. This how we should put it. But it's that organization of operation. Yes, organization of operations is okay. Organization of operations. Here we look at either operations are centralized, centralized, um, inherent risk is low, decentralized, decentralized, inherent risk is high. You see, even if I'm supervising here, if I'm supervising operations here, I can tell when something is not happening the way it should be. Yes, organizer. Yes, because I'm I'm here. I'm able to see. But even I'm supervising here, supervising in another building, another building at the same time. If I come here two minutes, I move to the next. Three minutes, I get to the next. Things will go wrong in my absence. So that you are saying, inherent risk is likely to be high when operations are decentralized. But if they are centralized, interest risk can be assessed to be low. Inherent risk can be assessed to be low. So all these points, when we get to crowd, it's a 240. It's a 240. All these points will be referred to as fraud, risk, factors. Fraud, risk, factors. I'm a fraud, risk, indicators. Fraud, risk, factors, or fraud, risk, indicators. In Amanisha, you know, frauds cannot easily be detected. We look for indicators. What indicate that there is likelihood of fraud? Because you cannot see it like this. These are fraud risk indicators. They indicate possibility of frauds. They indicate possibility of the red flags. The red flags when it comes to 
clouds. You can tell, even if you've not seen it, even if you've not detected it, here, uh, there is likelihood. There is likelihood uh, of, in kama uwoni msea na ka flight mode sa hile mkona ye. Ama which is another red flag. Flight mode. Yes. But I hope I hope the examples as if I'm sure also. Flight mode. Vibration here. Although vibration risk ni kidao. Kuliko flight mode risk. Silent. Yeah, silent risk is very high. Oh, forwarding calls. See, that's another very sensitive. Forwarding calls. No? Yes? Zero calls. Oh, zero calls and zero SMSs when you are together. You see, some points are coming. Yes? Yes? Broking. Oh, broking. Yeah, broking. Yeah, the people have not caught them. They are, they are all the indicators. They are all the indicators that all may not be okay. They are the same as these points. That you've not detected a fraud, but they are all the indicators that fraud can easily be perpetuated. We call them fraud risk factors or fraud risk um, indicators. That's industry characteristics. Women are managed engagement. Engagement characteristics. Engagement characteristics. Nature of client. Nature of client. Either new client or recurring. Recurring or neat client. When do you think we should assess inherent risk as being very high? New client or recurring audit client? When are we likely to assess inherent risk as being very high? New client, new client, new client. Because we don't know them. You've just you've just taken up an engagement with them. But recurring auditor, you know them. You know the areas of um high susceptibility to fraud, weaknesses of ICSs, you know. So for new client, we assess inherent risk as being very high. Here we assess inherent risk. <clears throat> it's being low. All right. Number two, um, we talk of um client history. Client history. If you have a history that fraud was perpetuated somewhere in 2021, the chief accountant was fired, then in 2022, July, the internal also was involved with the supplier. The case is still ongoing. It has tier. If you have such history. You said inherent risk is being very high, very high, very high. So if we have a um, history of fraudulent activities, fraudulent activities, we assess it as, as being very high. Number, th number three, um, interference. Interference with auditor's independence. You assess inherent risk as being very high. What is that they are interfering? Concealing, they might, they might be trying to conceal something. So when you find that your independence is being interfered with, interference with auditor's independence, you assess inherent risk as being very high. Interference with the auditor. So client's history, history of fraudulent activities, you assess it as, as being high. It's as well being uh, high interference with the auditor's independence. Remember, auditors should have unrestricted access to the books of accounts, records, and vouchers. But you find that somebody is restricting that this is a no-go zone. You should not call this data. Don't call this creditor. These are don't disturb this client and such. There is a problem. There is a, a problem. The last classification there was um, we call it either transaction, transaction, or financial. Financial characteristics. And these questions are so common, especially this one. We like testing about financial in the past financial assessment of inherent risk. So number one, transactions. Transactions not subjected. 
to ordinary processing, to ordinary processing. Inherent risk is high. That these are way things are done, but for this one, it has been treated differently. There's an issue. Transactions not subjected to ordinary processing. There is departure from the norm. There is departure from the usual. Yes, inherent risk as being very high. Two, we talk of um, unusual transactions at or towards at or towards the end of the financial period. It happens like this. This is our financial year. Our normal transactions happen like this. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. But when it's November, December, the amounts involved and the frequency increases. The amounts involved and the frequency increases. These are, these are nature of audit query. It's a red flag. We need to check what has been happening here. It happens even at county level. At ministry level, Nakutakwamba, uh, this is happening high. This is very high. Inherent risk is very high. There is a likelihood that related parties were involved. Yeah, but uh, tenders have been, tender pricing has been exaggerated. Such issues. Number three, client involved. <laughs> Clients involved in complex transactions, complex transactions requiring input of an expert. That you, as an officer, you cannot understand some things. Clients involved in complex transactions requiring input of an expert. That you as a professional accountant, there are some things you are not understanding. Not unless an expert sheds some light. Assess inherent risk as being very high. Assess inherent risk as being very high. Number four, client dealing with items which are highly highly susceptible, highly susceptible to theft and misuse. Highly susceptible, highly susceptible, either to resemble inherent risk relates to sus susceptibility. So there are times that the client deals with items which are highly susceptible to theft and misuse. And we find that the client is still accepting cash payments to be done. Assess inherent risk as being very high. You know cash is highly desirable, desirable and highly reportable. It can easily be stolen. But if you're dealing with the MPESA, checks assess inherent risk as being low. If you're dealing with items like jewelry, have I pronounced it right? <laughs> I don't Jewelry. Again, jewelry are very expensive, but they can easily be stolen. They are small. Somebody will walk out with them and uh, that's it, they're stolen, yeah? But when the client is dealing with integration, you call them as moving and self propelling What do you call them? The first class. The first class is still those heavy machines, yeah? We call we used to call them heavy machines and self propelling or something of that nature. Integration. Inherent risk will be assessed to be low. Although in Kenya, everything is positive. Even those are the moving machines will be stolen. And you, if sugar is stolen from where and it's taken to Isri and wherever, and we cannot tell what happened, who took it, and what it. Uh, but anyway, holding of the factors constants, Ceteris Peribas, when you're handling such huge, huge items, we assess inherent risk as being low. That's it on inherent risk. It's so huge. Inherent risk is so wide. Inherent risk is so wide. I had to repeat because you see the confusion we had. Uh, all right, let's look at what is now. Control risk. 
we are discussing the three components of audit risk. Number one was uh, inherent risk. Now we look at control risk. So you've seen those questions in the past papers. Although they don't ask so much. They just want you to define what's inherent risk, what's control risk, what's detection risk. So control risk. So it is the risk that it is the risk that the intern, the accounting, the accounting and internal control systems in place will not prevent and detect financial misstatements on a timely basis. So unlike inherent risk where we said we lack controls. Control risks, we have them. Only that they're not able to prevent and detect financial statements on a timely basis. They are there. Controls are there. But still, errors and frauds find their way. That's what it means. That's uh, what it means. I, I don't really have somebody who works in a bank, and uh, there's a guy who was... Is that guy was able to cash some checks and we didn't know what he was doing, how he did it. Actually, it's a, it's a courage. So any check from CBA, from wherever, he would cash that. And he was a very cool guy, very silent guy, very trusted guy. And that's why in, in, in our mother tongue we say, where the river is so cool. Yes. <laughs> It's very you can easily drown there, but where the disturbance is, you cannot easily drown. But where it looks like the water is still, my dear friend, yes, you will you will drown easily. How is that possible? How would one cash checks not in their names, in the name of the institution? And that's a control. We've discouraged cash payment, so cash the check is not to not to be safe. How is he doing it? Hmm? I think there's this operation. Operation, eh? Yeah, right. Or with a bank personnel somewhere. Oh, yes. Even the controllers. Huh. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, it's a discount. Oh, if you take it to them, they are able to. The bank presented. That could be possible. See, there's a way you can take the check somewhere. You, you, you get some money, uh, a discount. If it's worth 10,000, they're giving you 7,000 for you to have money now instead of waiting for several days to clear. Yeah. If you really cash all, all the checks, all the checks. Projects uh, coming from CBA. Yes, so actually, that's a very point, good point you mentioned about coercion. There's like a subtopic we discuss on Tuesday. Inherent limitations in ICS. Point number one, coercion. That controls are okay, but we have some weaknesses which we can't do so much about them. When we choose to coerce, even if the controls are very strong, we still perpetuate a fraud. So unlike in inventory square, we like controls. We are saying here controls are there, but errors and fraud still find their way. So control risk assessment. Control risk assessment. So here we say 
control control risk is assessed to be high when number two number one errors and frauds are present in the client systems or in the in the clients errors and frauds are present in the clients of operations when you find that there are errors and frauds that's outright this is what you said in law less ipsa loquitara what was less ipsa loquitara Less ipsa loquitara. I like reminding you about this so that even in interview, sometimes the panelists may be disturbing, and and you silence them with these ones. They just say okay, and then they realize they need not to disturb you. So many other questions. Less ipsa loquitara is facts speak for themselves. It was a phrase used in uh, negligence. There's something that actually is that there's somewhere you may find a car having uh, done an accident or caused an accident, and you're like, ah, now, there was no mist. It's okay, this must have been negligence. That's what we mean by facts speak for themselves. You need not to explain so much. The facts speak it all. So, errors and frauds are present in the client operations. It's evident. If there are errors and frauds, it means that the controls in place are not working. You can't defend it otherwise. And very advice. Well, number two, when <clears throat> controls are inadequate, as controls are there, but it's like in an organization you may have a, a, a black book at the reception where you record your time when you check in and record your time when you check out. So that's a control, but is it is it adequate? No, and especially if there's no one supervising how you are writing, because I can even sign out now and record I left here tonight. Or even come, come late, but you record, you came in at exactly eight in the morning. So that's an instance of controls being inadequate. They are there, but they're inadequate. Problem number three, when control environment is weak, and ineffective, ineffective, e.g., lack of internal audit function. Lack of internal audit function is the same as eh, management dominating this point, because when management dominates, it means there is no internal audit. That's control environment. So when control environment is so weak or ineffective, we consider control risks as being very high. When there's no oversight body management dominates, we assess control risk as being very high. That's it on control risk. That's it on control risk. That's it on control risk. The last cluster, detection risk. Detection, detection risk, detection risk. Better ahead, Billy. That second match, second match, second match. Detection risk.
the list that the orchestral substantive tests and analytical procedures will fail to detect a material misstatement that exists. Uh, auditor does everything, does some observations, some inspections, some inquiries, but still some misstatements pass undetected. The risk that the auditor substantive tests and analytical review procedures will fail to detect substantive tests in historia observation, inspection, inquiries, recalculations, reperformance, that part, um, we call it um, external confirmations. He does all that, but still, some errors and frauds pass undetected. Some errors and frauds pass undetected. It happens. It happens. Classified or is um, classified into two. Sampling risk and non sampling, very common question. Sampling risk and We have some planet friends facing problem. So sampling risk is, is, a, is a risk which arises as a result of the sample size. When you select a sample size, you are likely not to detect material statements. If you want to get a lot of information about a population, go for a right sample. Otherwise, if you go for a small sample, this will amount to sampling risk. So sampling risk arises due to the size of the sample. If you wish to reduce the sampling risk, what do you need to do? Increase the sample size. Uh, like uh, here in class, I may, I may test these armrest chairs, the front row, one, two, five, six, seven, eight. Then I tell you that all the armrest chairs in this class are right-handed. On them to find a, a, a right hand somewhere after increasing the sample size after increasing the sample size. So sampling risk. So what that means, eh? that when you increase the sample size, you are likely to get different findings. That's the sampling risk, that if you increase the sample size, you are going to get different results. To reduce the sampling risk, you're supposed to uh, increase the sample size, right? And say, it is the risk that it is the risk that it is the risk that conclusion based on the sample, conclusion based on the sample, conclusion based on the sample will deviate. Conclusions based on the sample will deviate from the conclusions reached, will deviate. From the conclusions reached, will deviate from the conclusions reached. If the entire population, if the entire population, if the entire population was subjected, if the entire population was subjected to the same audit test, if the entire population was subjected to the same audit test if the entire population was subjected to the same audit test. Uh, it will be totally... <laughs> there's a tiny there's a media had confused us. Yes, they were telling us uh, uh, things, may, things are likely to go wrong if you marry from Nyeri. You remember, you remember that analysis? <laughs> yes? And we are making conclusion based on how many relays. Just very few, just very few. Those who came to the line. Yes? Yes, the girl was beaten. Yes. Valerie. Yeah? Yes? I agree. 
if we went on the ground, if we went to the mountain and confirmed some workers. We are not on the ground, things are different. But marriages are working, driving so well down there. I thought media was misreading us based on a very small sample of very few complaints. Yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah. It's another one they did, they say, because of the closure of bars in Chicago, uh -huh. it's another lot. The guys are looking where the delivery comes. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is that shit. They are going to be very mad. To nearly now. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Okay, okay, I lost my case. Lost my case. But anyway, I agree we are now able to get right that a sample may be confusing if it's not representative. But if it's representative, we are able to get very good results, very good results, which can be projected to represent the entire population. So so there, have you said to reduce the sampling risk? To reduce, what it say? To reduce sampling risk. To reduce sampling risk is a continuation. To reduce sampling risk, the order should increase the sample size. To reduce sampling risk, the order should increase the sample size. To reduce the sampling risk, order sh should increase the sample size, which means that, which means that, which means that, Sampling risk arises. Sampling risk arises due to the size of the sample, which means that sampling risk arises due to the size of the sample. Auditor should increase the sample size, which means that, which means that sampling risk arises due to the size of the sample. Sampling risk arises due to the size of the sample. Next, non-sampling risk. Non sampling risk. E hey, no, see, on a sample size relative to night and non sampling risk. E, E Nishidaya, thank you. The problem is here because of carrying the wrong test. You can imagine if you carried out the wrong test, even to a patient, you can never get it right what they're hearing from. Or even if you carried the correct tests, but you find yourself misinterpreting the findings, again, you can never get it right. You will not be able to detect the ailment which the patient is suffering from and so is in auditing you carry out the wrong tests or you carry out the correct test but misinterpret the findings this will amount to non-sampling risk even if the sample size is okay so let me say it is the risk that an auditor it is the risk that an auditor it is the risk that an auditor we reach a wrong conclusion. An auditor will reach a wrong conclusion. The risk that an auditor will reach a wrong conclusion for any reason, for any reason not related to the size of the sample. The auditor will reach a wrong conclusion for any reason not related to the size of the sample for any reason not related to the size of the sample, not related to the size of the sample, e.g. the use of inappropriate procedures, 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 or misinterpretation of audit evidence, or misinterpretation of audit evidence or misinterpretation of audit evidence misinterpretation of audit evidence so when that happens we'll never get it right if that happens we'll never get it right then it means we'll not be able to detect a material misstatement that exists talk of errors errors associated errors associated with Detection risk. Errors associated with detection risk. We have type, type one error. 
we'll define this as involves rejecting a true hypothesis. Rejecting a true hypothesis. Then Roma number two, type two error, accepting a false hypothesis. Those who have done QA have come across this. Somebody did QA. Everyone. You know, there are some guys when you are like Peter and I, if you talk about intermediate to kind of foundation, now we are Peter foundation or kind of intermediate. So we are Peter and we are Yes, I am a crisis because I do not advanced QA. Problem arises when you miss out financial management, then you meet advanced FM. Yes, in the name of Nairobi, in Anka, Bira Foundation, Mzul. Yes, Bira Foundation. When I could have collapse. Yes, but QA when you are in China now, you are still safe. You are still safe because Hakuna Mali Pengi. Turn now. Rejecting a true hypothesis. A good example. Jama Amanda could test your COVID. Hakuna Mali Pengi. That's like one error. Umeenda kutest vitabu. Yes. Unasema kwamba they, uh, they have um, uh, they, they, unasema kwamba ziko na errors that you report that they do not have. They are not material misstatements. That's type 1 error. Type 2 error is accepting the false hypothesis. Kusema they are material misstated when they are not. Sema wakona COVID, lakini hawana COVID. Those are type 1 and type 2 error. So accepting, uh, rejecting a false, a true hypothesis. Number two, accepting a false hypothesis. Why the kitabu yet we answer some questions and answers when we define to fault. That definition is wrong. That definition is wrong. You know, human being is to error. Human being is to error. So, usi pate iyo definition ushangai na sasa i i yakiremo kwa ni toka iko iko na. Mistake. Although you give me some idea, you a mistake. Calculation is not a crisis. Have you ever tried to buy questions and answers for calculations? Sometimes you may spend three hours looking for where the seventy is coming from. No, I'm sorry, in a balance, the T E the seventy is not correct. When I try to like one word of word, you know, you can spend all day looking for some figure. But theories are are good. At least they give you some guidance. They give you some guidance. So when you're relying on them in calculations, ukau kijua inaenda gaaji. Si ati kurirai. Ni kama kurirai na haka kamurembo kana tuambia katan left. Yeah. Sometimes you're somewhere there's no turn right, and they're telling you turn right, turn left. Yes. You should be knowing where you're going. You have an idea. You have an idea of what to expect, so that you are not uh, confused. So here you can a mistake. There's a time I was going to shrine uh, Subuki shrine at night for a night vigil. The girl was telling me to turn right and it's a forest. There's no way to turn right. And Sunday it's at night. All right. Detection risk assessment. Detection risk assessment. Detection risk assessment. These are very common questions. The questions on risks. And uh, the, the beauty of these is that they don't, they don't make uh, questions complicated. It's, Helen, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share those notes. I'll share those notes on our WhatsApp, on our WhatsApp group. So you should not be uh, worried. So write and say, <laughs> detection risk as an inverse relationship with Combined 
flavors of inherent and control risks, i.e., when inherent and control risks are assessed to be high detection risk is assessed to be a blow mm -hmm. and vice versa. Like in this case, and the case name vice versa. Yes, because <laughs> name we want to see what this vice versa you are talking about. Otherwise, vice versa that answer is not complete. <laughs> it's incomplete. It's uh incomplete. So we are saying inverse relationship. Actually, when inverse risk is assessed to be high, control risk is assessed to be high, detection risk will be assessed to be low. Inherent risk is assessed to be low, control risk is assessed to be low, detection risk will be assessed to be high. How does it happen? How does it happen? When is inherent risk high, management lacks integrity. Management are not experienced. When is control risk high? Lots of errors and frauds have been perpetuated. When lots of errors and frauds have perpetuated, do you go for a small sample or a large sample? When you expect lots of misstatements, lots of fraud, lots of theft, you go for a small sample or large? Large. So going for a large sample, then detection risk is low. What have we just said? To reduce sampling risk, increase the sample size. So detection is in a poor flow. But when everything seems to be okay, come here, you to me imagine Yes, everything seems to be fine. Management are competent. They are persons of integrity. ICSs are strong. You are likely to go for a small sample. Small sample, you are exposing yourself to very high levels of detection risk. It's very practical. High levels of detection risk. All right. The... Last item, detection risk matrix. Detection risk matrix. It's just a matrix to explain this.
So this means that, check this, when inherent risk is high, control risk is high, their meeting point represents detection risk. So inherent risk is high, control risk is high, detection risk is low. That's one extreme. This other extreme is when inherent risk is low, control risk is low. Detection risk is high. So the meeting point represents detection risk. When inherent risk is low, control risk is high, detection risk will be assessed to be medium. That's what it means. So their meeting point represents, their meeting point represents detection risk. Their meeting point represents detection risk. Represents. So when we meet on Tuesday, we're discussing ICS. ICS is topic number eight. Remember we said uh, management and practice of audit practice, we are supposed to discuss three topics. I think it was, I think three topics, yes, or four. <laughs> discussing risk of risk and planning, then we discussed planning, we discussed ICS, actually there were four topics. We are through with three topics. Now we'll be handling the fourth on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Naitaisha, Naitaisha, but I'll have shared so many other uh, soft copy notes. Because ICS is very wide. ICS, ah, it's very wide, it's very wide. So we stop at that. Get ready for uh, internal control systems uh, on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Unless there's a question, we say the grace. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us now and forevermore. Amen. We rank up on when it's to have a blessed weekend. Kesho to can be at the sun. Yeah, to be a kubalikiwa kabisa.